Welcome to the Smart Property Investment Show with your host, Phil Tarrant. Lucky you, this isn't Phil Tarrant. It's in fact Katerina Torian and I'm the head of editorial here at Smart Property Investment. Today I'm joined by fellow property investor Max Panyon, who is going to have a chat to us about how he drives and measures success in his property portfolio. Welcome, Max. I like Kat. It's great to have you here today. Now, give us a recap, high level. What does your property portfolio look like? Yeah, Kat. So I've got nine properties at the moment, which I've had uh, oh, probably since a couple of years now, that, that number. And um I'm in, the, I guess, the consolidation phase of the portfolio at the moment. I've started sort of acquiring property since early 2013. Mm-hmm. Uh, one was um, was in in Minto in southwest Sydney, for those who know that area, around the Campbelltown area. Uh, and then another one in Oberon not long thereafter, later in, in the year, in 2014 actually. And then I, I purchased um, a couple of properties up in Queensland in quick succession and then another one in a mining town called Weeper, right. who a lot of people may not know of. It's in the Gulf of Carpentaria. And that was purely for cash flow because at that stage, it was getting a bit harder to get further uh, lending from the banks. So I needed something with good cash flow. Mm. And that allowed me to then continue borrowing and uh, investing. And I, my subsequent purchases, the last four were in Hobart in Tasmania, which is uh, in hindsight has been a very, very good um, decision to make and uh, very happy with the way that, that, that those particular properties have performed as well. When did you buy in Hobart? So the first one I bought was in uh, 2016, so around April. So I've had it for just over three years now and then... Oh, good timing. Yeah, perfect yeah, timing. Yeah. yeah, and then a few months later I bought a, another one and then uh, that property went up fairly quickly in value and I managed to get some equity out of that for a third one in late 2016 and then the last one was a bought that in May of 2017 so yeah they've all done very well and the three of them have probably gone up by at least 100 to 150,000 each one and then the last one's only a, a, in a cheaper suburb it was only 220 but that's probably gone up by 55 grand just that one alone so it's yeah that those those four properties of I've done really well, very happy with that. Yeah, right. So that's nine properties in what, six years? Correct, yeah. My yep. goodness, how have you financed that? Initially it was uh, I had I had saved some, some cash together and I bought the the one in Minto, which was back in the time when no one was still looking at Sydney property because it was uh, obviously not going anywhere and everyone was investing in Brisbane or in Melbourne, other, other areas, and I saw value in a particular property that was – I purchased it for three twenty seven with a rent of three eighty at the time, so mm. the cash flow made sense, even if I didn't um, have any crystal ball as to where the market was going to go in terms of capital growth. But obviously, that was the actual time to get in uh, in that part of Sydney. Mm. And then I had an ex marital home from from a divorce that I sold that property uh, later in the year, and I managed to get some funds together for a couple of purchases in. Um, Brisbane, one south and one north of Brisbane. So yeah, so that was a uh, yeah that sort of got me got me uh, going from there, and then just getting some equity out of some of some of the other properties as they went up in value. So the Minto property, I t- pulled some equity out of that to to fund some purchases um, in Tassie, and then and it went forward from there. Yeah, okay. If you don't mind me asking, how did you go when the banks tied into the purse strings a couple of years ago? Yeah, um, de- definitely noticed it uh, probably in the last twelve months where it's been harder to get any further further lending, and and I've and I've asked my broker about that, and um, it's just been tough for everyone, I believe, and in, uh, you know a lot of the people that I speak to are in the similar situation where they've had a got a few properties and they're just having to, I guess, uh, consolidate what they've got. So it's uh, it's definitely an interesting environment at the moment to to get uh, any further lending, especially if you do have quite a bit. Uh, of, of debt in your own name so it's it is a, a bit of a challenge but what I've been doing recently is using that as an opportunity to for example um, do some renovations and, and add value that way to some of the properties so one of the properties in in Tassie for example I, I redid the kitchen and um, and the bathroom and and had it repainted and that was uh, you know enabled me to to increase the rent by thirty dollars a, a a week and then and obviously subsequently increase it since then and another property in Brisbane that I've had which I've uh, recently had it repainted and, and tidied a few things outside just to, to add some value to it so yeah I'm just using the opportunity now to, to when I've saved some cash to, to uh, add value through renovations and then subsequently increasing rent where, where I can. Did you do your own renos? 
No, no, I'm not a. Uh, well, the ones in Hobart, it's a bit hard to get down there and do it. And Fair. same in, in, in. If I had, if it was anything uh, in Sydney where I could uh, do basic renovations such as repainting or things like that, I would, I would. But yeah, when it comes to interstate, you know, you, you're better off just paying off, paying the tradies down uh, with the local ones and getting them to do it for you. So. Oh, to be fair, if you saw the job that I did on my grout, you'd probably say I should have paid some tradies as well <laughs> on my places in Sydney. Um, well, I'm glad that you actually had a go doing the grout. It's not for everyone. <laughs> yeah, well, Bunnings is pretty glad I had a go as well because I had to, <laughs> had to buy a lot of repair equipment following that. So you started investing in 2013. That's right. Okay, what was the the main motivator for you? Because that's kind of a little bit later than a lot of investors start. Yeah, well, look, I I, I had properties um, previously in my um, I guess uh, late twenties, early thirties, which I I invested and sold throughout the, the time, and then used some some of that cash to get into a principal place of residence at the time, like a lot of people do. But then I decided to. Yeah, following my, you know, my my separation and divorce, I decided to. Well, I wasn't going to do the typical, you know, buying and and having a principal place of residence. I preferred to to actually use that um, uh, the funds I had to invest and then rent uh, instead. So mm. I that was my strategy. And um, yeah, if I if I didn't follow that strategy, I wouldn't have what I've got today in terms of the property portfolio and the equity that I've built up over the the last six years or so. So you're rent vesting? Yes, absolutely. In Sydney? Yes, in uh, Western Sydney, in a place called um, Abbotsbury, Mm -hmm. uh, for people who know that area, not far from Bosley Park, yes. Yeah, okay. And how do you find it? It took me a while to get my head around rent vesting. Yeah, um, for me, it's, uh, you know, I always look at, because, you know, in terms of my profession being a financial planner, I look at things from a cash flow point of view. So the way I see it, if it's cheaper to buy in an area than to rent, then it does make sense to buy. But if it's cheaper to rent than to buy, then you've got uh, some cash flow savings, which you can then invest in other areas. And that's the way I sort of evaluate, you know, what I do uh, financially and, and even when it comes to property as well. So if that, for example, that property in Minto that I bought for 327 you know, now you'd, you'd be paying close to five, you know, anywhere between 570 to 580 590 in the current market. But the rental income's only gone up from 380 a week to 410 at the moment. So... So I wouldn't buy that in today's market because the rental yield is just not there to to make it a worthwhile investment. Mm. So I always always look at that. Uh, the cash flow comes into it, and obviously capital growth as well. But you need to you need to be able to fund the properties, and and even so that I've, um, with my properties and loans that I have, some of those have gone to um, principal and interest. I can still fund those because I've got a fairly healthy cash flow. Mm. Um, you know, backing the uh, the, the lending. When you say they went into principal and interest, like they were forced into it by bank. yeah, exactly, yeah, right. exactly. So uh, yeah, the, the the with the changes in the the lending environment, the banks uh, and and I mean I could have gone kept a couple of those on interest only, but the rate to go to P and I was was a lower rate than interest only rates, and there wasn't a lot of extra cost in terms of going from interest only to principal and interest. So I I figured well if it's if that's the case, I may as well go down that path and. Have the um, you know some of those loans starting to be paid off over time? We spoke to a lot of investors uh, last year, particularly early last year, when the banks were switching their interest-only loans to principal and interest, and a lot got caught out, particularly in Sydney, because markets are down, vacancy rates are pretty high, particularly in um, in parts of the southwest and the northwest, meaning cash flow was a bit compromised. And then surprise, now you're onto principal and interest. So it was a was that a, a bit of a shock for you, or was it? relatively manageable yeah manageable yeah my cash flow allows it but yeah for example I went from having say a a negative this is before tax cash flow of of around two grand over nine properties which is nothing to sort of currently probably sitting around 16 grand so in the last sort of year or so I've you know it's an extra 14 grand on my on my pre-tax cash flow so I mean, after tax with depreciation and what have you, it's only you know, slightly negative, but it, so it's uh, it's still uh, definitely manageable. But but yeah, for some people, if you know all of your loans suddenly you know within a short period of time go to uh, principal and interest, it, it will be a struggle. Um, so you do have to do your numbers and and factor that in. And and I mean, obviously, we've had some interest rate falls recently, which uh, which have sure you know, have yeah, slash, I believe. Yeah, which is a relief for some people um, who are on variable rates. But um, yeah, you, you know, whenever you you do your numbers, you have to factor in that you know we are at historical low interest rates, and it's not going to be this way 
forever uh rates will eventually at some stage go up and then you know you need to factor that in that you need to have a buffer and be able to 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 um yeah make sure you can still fund the properties if that that does happen yeah particularly in sydney do you have any any rules with where you will or won't invest so for me for example being from the the southern suburbs myself i'm terrified of buying you just because of the the quality of some developments that i've seen and that wasn't just triggered by some big headline debacles like the Opal Tower, the Mascot Towers. Um, well before that, some of the things I could see cropping up yeah. were uh, were pretty horrific to say the least. Um, so you're a Sydney boy. How do you how do you feel about that? Yeah, I, I tend to agree with you. Um, I think for investing, you know, you you, you want to be st- steering away from brand new properties and and uh, looking at established properties and properties where you know maybe there's you need to get your hands dirty a bit and get you know do some some work to to bring it up to scratch in terms of some renovations and adding value that way I believe that's the the, the smarter way to go where you can uh, buy something that might be you know, undervalued for various reasons aesthetically you know it could be an outdated kitchen or a bathroom and then you know it doesn't mean you have to do it straight away but at some stage you can you can renovate those and add value to those properties and 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 bring it up to, to market and and you know coat of paint on you know, whether or, or it could be um you know those old uh, you know ugly sort of red bricks uh, you know, cement rendering for example and and making it more modern and and just those sort of things which you know don't have to spend an arm and a leg to do can add significant value to a property and and make it sort of seem like a newer property for those who are then looking to buy it in the future. Okay, I've got a red brick, so I'll pretend not to be offended by that. No, well, some of the red bricks are, <laughs> are quite nice, you know, the, the Federation style, but, you know, there's some of those other red bricks which are pretty how you going. bit so. basic, yeah, a <laughs> yeah. bit how you going. That's yeah. probably a good way to put it. I completely agree. So I, um, I did a few uh, just really tidy ups uh, inside my place and I increased my rent by $50 a week. And it was really just painting, bit of TLC, bit of grout, yeah. <laughs> um, you know. And uh, for a, what I've got is a '60s walk-up, so as you can imagine, it, it was just in need of a bit of TLC. But it doesn't take much, does it? No, you're right, exactly right. And, and even with my one of the properties in that I said I, I renovated in Tassie, I spent probably you know six and a half grand with a local builder, getting a, a basic caboodle kitchen from from Bunnings and and. Uh, um, a cabinet that I found on Gumtree that had delivered to him um, from a from a local seller, which he installed in the in the the bathroom and and um, you know he bought a new shower screen, updated a few things here and there, and yeah, I was able to increase my rent on that by thirty dollars a week, which was um, a bit under because the tenant's father um, was a, an ex painter, so he actually painted the the walls for me, so I didn't charge the full sort of freight of the what the rent should be because they cool. did me a favour, so. Yeah. Uh, you know, I just paid for the paint, but yeah, so I got fresh paint job out of it. But um, yeah, it, it's winning. I think you know, with tenants, you have to really, you know, my golden rule is, um, you know, you've got to look after them because it's your asset. You know, I know I've heard of landlords out there that, um, you know, uh, don't want to change, um, you know, a, a broken tap or something because you know it's fifty bucks out of their pocket. You know what I mean? It, at the end of the day, yeah, if you look after the tenants and respect them, they'll respect you and yeah. and they'll treat the property as if it was their own property and, and, and you're likely to, to have less ongoing issues where if you treat them as if they're, they're, um, they're nobodies and, and, you know, never look at, um, you know, at their sort of maintenance requests or, or treat them seriously, then, you know, if eventually they're not going to look after the place. It's going to become a, a, a dump and mm-hmm. then you're going to have to front up with a fair bit of money when they leave and then you need to get everything uh, fixed at the same time. It's just not... It's just not the way to do it, I reckon. Yeah, I completely agree. It's pretty short sighted, actually. I would go, I'd go mental at my um, at my property agent if I found out that they weren't sort of telling me what what it is that my um, that my tenants need. They're good tenants. I want them to stay. So fifty bucks here and there. Sometimes it's a couple of hundred when drains get blocked or whatever. Exactly. But, you know, in the long term, it works in your favour. Hundred I mean, percent. Something's vacant for a few weeks, which it would be if tenants move out. That's a that's a good few hundred dollars, isn't it? It's yeah, it, like it's, it's 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 an investment. You know, like like. You, you spend money on your um, your landlord's insurance, uh, you know, in case something happens to the, the property. You know, you 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 know, you should um, really be on top of your maintenance and and yeah, you know, whenever even today I got uh, one of the the agents in in Hobart came through with um, they did the inspection and and highlighted a couple of little things here that needed doing. So I said, yeah, let's just get it done. I didn't even I didn't even think twice about it. It's just yeah, get it done. It shows it to the tenant that you know you care about them and. And you want them to be comfortable, and at the end of the day, they'll then you know value your property and, and make sure that you know 
they're not they're, they're going to look after it. Yeah. So what's the end goal with all of this for you? You're going to retire in Hobart? Uh, <laughs> that would be nice, actually. <laughs> I, I wouldn't mind. Uh, yeah. Look, you never know. I've got four properties to choose from, so yeah. <laughs> I can always uh, you know move into one of them. So yeah. Look, it, it, I, I'm looking at potentially. Um, you know, maybe offloading one of the properties in Brisbane later this year mm-hmm. um, in terms of because I've got one of them uh, or two of them are coming off um, uh, in a, a fixed rate, which is uh, interest only. So they'll be likely going to principal and interest. So just so I'm not uh, sort of overextending myself, I may look at uh, selling one of those and then looking at buying a principal place of residence in Sydney. So yeah, uh, using the equity from that or the sale from that property. So that's okay. uh, that's what I'm looking at potentially at later this year or early next year. Okay, you wouldn't just move into one that you've already got. I could. Uh, my partner wouldn't probably want to be moving to Minto. No disrespect to those who live in Minto because yeah, I actually don't mind the place. But uh, yeah, she likes the sort of the area that we live in, close to family and what have you. So okay. probably uh, stick to around that area. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. You said you're invested in a mining town as well up in Queensland? I did. It's a mining town called Weeper. So it's it's basically, it's not something that I would generally recommend, certainly not as your first property. And I only bought that as a an avenue to to increase my cash flow because it was, it was quite a very a good rental return on from, from what I paid for the property. So mm. for example, it, it, the property was 350. It's a little, I will say little, it's a three bedroom I guess they call it a, a unit, but it's effectively a, a villa mm. uh, in, a, in a block of four with um, with a self managed strata. So we just pay pay it amongst the owners, so I don't have strata uh, levies as such. And that was renting when I bought it for five eighty a week. So it's a very oh, solid cash good. flow. Yeah. Okay. Um, now it's gone up to six hundred. So so that was uh, a purchase just really to because I was getting stuck with uh, getting any further lending at the time uh, so I needed something with a good cash flow and that came up and on the radar screen and I I went ahead with it um, yeah I'm not expecting any sort of major capital growth there in fact I don't think it's gone up at all since I've I've bought it but yeah purely bought it for cash flow but yeah not it's not something you would do or I wouldn't recommend that you would do as your first two or three properties, but it, it served a purpose for me and that's the reason why I went up there and, and got that one as well. Yeah, I'm scared of mining towns. How, how have you found um, renting it out? Yeah, I've never had any, any issues. I've had three sets of tenants there and I've always been able to find uh, tenants. And the, and the only reason, I'm a bit like you, I was always wary of mining towns and heard some really bad horror stories. Um, the only reason I, I was confident in that particular town was that um, Rio Tinto were uh, had in, were investing $2.3 billion in a brand new bauxite mine, which is one of the key ingredients for, for aluminium. So I figured, well... And climate change at that. Well, that too, yeah. <laughs> so, but I figured if they were looking to invest that kind of money in, in, the, in a local mine, then they're going to be there for the long term. So, and, and from what I read... When I did my research, they had a, a break-even uh, time frame. I think it was about uh, might have been 18 years on the mine. So they need, they've got to be there for, for 18 years just to break even on that investment. So, okay. So you know, I figured there's going to be some some kind of demand for workers um, with the new mine plus the existing mine. So I figured, uh, yeah, there was a, a bit of a, a redundancy there. If, if um, you know, in terms of not being able to find tenants, I didn't think it was going to be much of an issue, and then it's proven to be the case. Okay, yeah, fair. So you said you're a financial planner. Do you yeah. have any investments outside of property then? Yeah, I do uh, have, you know, I invest, invest in shares through my super. I've just got a retail super and, and just invest in some shares and manage funds in that. So that's mm-hmm. my other investment but yeah in terms of um sort of outside super uh, it's it's all through property predominantly so yeah that's where i've i've built my wealth and yeah just because of the the uh, uh being able to leverage um with property you do have that um ability to do that um but obviously with that comes um some you know, responsibility in, in, in not overextending yourself and making sure that you manage your cash flow and you're not um you know sort of biting off more than you can chew um and i have seen some clients unfortunately in the last a year or so where they they've virtually been in tears because their their interest only loans have gone on to P and I and and they're struggling to to um, sort of make ends meet, um, especially people on single incomes and what have you. So, mm. yeah, it, it's it, 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 yeah, it, you have to really tread carefully when you're starting to buy a lot of properties and and make sure that you know you you've got some buffers in place and 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 factor in that you know yeah interest rates can go up and and 
and and and some loans will go to P and I at some stage as well. That you you can't keep going interest only forever. Yeah, most financial planners tend to know what they're doing with um, superannuation. Is there any particular reason you never explored the um, self managed super fund to put a property in there? Yeah, well, look, being being self employed, I um, you know the way I structured myself, I didn't have the the the, uh, the obligation to put in sort of extra contributions in the super. So I saved outside of super, and I, I figured I'll. I'd rather sort of invest where I can um, obtain the benefits of leverage. So I didn't, ha- I haven't sort of essentially got enough there in, in to, to establish a self-managed super fund with what I've got in my current super. And I, I mean, some people have I've I've seen and set set them up with a hundred grand or or even sometimes less, which I think is is ridiculous. But you know, you, you really, yeah, you know, in my opinion, you really need at least two hundred plus to consider a self-managed super fund to make it worthwhile mm. in terms of all the setup costs and 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 ongoing costs that are related to it. Because uh, if you consider these days that some of the industry funds are only charging 0.3, 0.4% admin fee, if you're you know, got a hundred thousand dollar SMSF with two and a half grand of ongoing costs, accounting fees, and audit fees. That's two and a half percent cost just to to run the self managed super fund. So, mm. to me, it doesn't make sense unless you have a decent amount uh, sitting in the super to, to make it worthwhile. Yeah, I think the corporate regulator would probably agree with you on that one. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> no other wild investments outside of property. Then I had someone on the show a couple of weeks ago who said uh, he invests in racehorses and Bitcoin. And as someone who doesn't like speculative investment and is a vegetarian, it was hard for me to respond to that. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's an interesting one. Actually, I, and I actually know a couple of uh, mates from soccer who uh, you know are in the uh, the horse game, where they they they've got got some uh, shares in race horses, and um, but they'll tell you as well that you know it's 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 a, it's really hard. To, it's a tough uh, gig to make money in, in the. Ra- you have to really be lucky to pick something that just you know, does well, and yeah, you know, and you haven't just done your day because there's lots of ongoing costs with that bitcoin i'm not a fan of it's just so volatile it's it's insane i mean i know yeah people that have uh, made some money or like people that have lost money for me it's just too speculative you mm. may as well go to the casino and have a have a have a punt there if you're going to throw some money at bitcoin I'd, mm. yeah I'd, i prefer to stick to tra- traditional assets such as property and shares and i don't think you can go too far wrong yeah no i'm definitely on the same page as you there max it's been an absolute pleasure thanks for coming into the studio today thank you kate much appreciated if you'd like to get in touch with myself or Phil, you can reach us at editor at smartpropertyinvestment.com.au. You can also follow us on Facebook. We're at Smart Property HQ and all of the other socials as well. If you like what you heard today, make sure you drop us a rating. Thanks and we'll catch you next time. The information featured in this podcast is general in nature and does not take into consideration your financial situation or individual needs and should not be relied upon. Before making any investment, insurance, tax, property or financial planning decision, you should consult a licensed professional who can advise whether your decision is appropriate for you. Guests appearing on this podcast may have a commercial relationship with the companies mentioned.